Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to North Haven. It's good to see you all. It's good to be seen by those of us joining via the live stream. Uh, my name is Adam Sidler. I'm the senior pastor here to my left. To your right, this is Pastor Aaron. He's our next-gen pastor, and we're excited to be here together. Uh, for those of you who may be here for the first time watching live stream, uh, we have two services, 9 10 30, uh, 10, 30 service. Uh, the only thing that's different is the worship. Um, otherwise, our services are identical. It's so great to be together, and it's so great to have experienced what we did this last Sunday. Uh, Aaron, your, your wife and you, you were guys who were a part of, you were Lex Luthor. I think your wife was Superwoman, yes. And uh, that was fantastic. I was dressed up as the best dad in the world. It was just a fantastic time together. Um, but uh, we, we have been celebrating all week by what God did this last week. Thank you so much to all of you who volunteered and were a part of that experience. Uh, you made that a success, so thank you. I love this clip. One of the things uh, that I absolutely love, it's the best thing that Jesus, I think, says in this whole show, and that is when he turns to Peter and he says, get used to different. I think maybe that was, uh, that's a bit of a summation of Jesus' um, message, even as we read in the Gospels. Um, I tried using that with my kids the other day. That didn't work out as well. Uh, but... Uh, but this is a, this is a, a memorable, uh, we've, we've read about this, we've heard about this story where, where Jesus comes across Matthew, the tax collector, that's a big deal, right? We've talked about that, how this tax collector, I mean, it was the most loathsome person uh, amongst Jews at this time. I mean, this was somebody that, that was taking money, yes, but he was taking money from other Jews, from fellow Jews, being a Jew himself, and then giving that to the Roman government. Uh, so th these were people that people absolutely hated. And, and who is it that others compared tax collectors to? Do you remember when they chastised Jesus for having dinner with tax collectors? Who, who were the people that they synonymized with tax collectors? Sinners. So this, I mean, a loathsome group of people. Yet Jesus when he comes across Matthew, as we see in Matthew chapter 9, verse 9, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Two words, follow me. Follow me, he told Matthew, and Matthew got up and followed him. Now, that's, that's interesting. Two words, simple words that Jesus used, and Matthew's life drastically changed. And when I think about how it is that Matthew responded and what Jesus was essentially asking of Matthew and of others when he said these two words, follow me, it's two things. One is giving up, and two is giving in. It's interesting with those two phrases that we, we tend to, when we hear these two things, we synonymize them with negative things, right? Right? We don't want to give up, and we don't want to give in. These are things that we try very hard to avoid. But yet, these are essential ingredients to actually fulfill the mission, the mission that Jesus asks of Matthew and of others when he says, follow me, because he asks that of us as well. Those of us who have decided to follow Jesus, to make him the leader of our lives, we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We believe that he died on the cross for our sins and then rose from the dead and is living today. To do that, we are following Jesus. We are also answering that call. So what does that mean? It means giving up and giving in. What does giving up mean? It means instead of holding on to things that we think are ours, we rather have an open hand. We understand that God gives, and he also what? Takes away. We convince ourselves because of our sinful nature and our ultimate desire to be in control, because that's when we oftentimes feel comfortable, is it not? We convince ourselves that we need to hold on to things tightly, but just, just like with, with my car, I don't really own my car. The bank owns my car. And at any point, the bank gave, and at any point, the bank can take away, right? We hold on to things that aren't ours. That's giving up. It is, hold, it is, it is holding on to the things that we have with an open hand. 
willing to have those things released from us, either for God's purpose or for people in need in any moment and in any way. But then giving in, surrender, giving, giving God everything. That means your talents. That means your gifts, how he's equipped you, how he's purposed you, your resources, all these things, we surrender to God. That is what it means to follow Jesus. That is what Matthew did. He gave up everything. He had a lucrative position. He had money at his fingertips, wealth. Yet he was able to give that all all away simply because Jesus said, follow me. And that comes about in very tangible circumstances. We find that happen in our lives when we drive by someone who's on the side of the road holding up a sign saying, I'm homeless and I'm hungry. That's a tangible opportunity for us to live out what it means to give up and to give in. But there are other tangible ways as well. And one of those ways is what we've been talking about for the last few weeks, and that is our 2022 faith promise. So as Pastor Adam said, we've been talking about this for the past couple of weeks. This is our missions uh, focus, our missions emphasis time of year. And so as you saw in the comments, we've got the displays there. But for our faith promise specifically, that's designed to be uh, an annual commitment to support the various missions and missionaries that we have going on uh, through our church that we're partnered with. And so we want it to be a financial commitment uh, that is above and beyond your tithe. It's, it's not included in the, the tithe, which is designed to support the ministry needs of our church, but it's instead specific to uh, these mis- uh, ministries, these missionaries, these uh, uh, missions opportunities that we have uh, partnered with and, and that we get to be a part of uh, through our church. And so as you think about what Uh, God is asking you to give towards this faith promise. This isn't a a time where we're going to be collecting money for it today. We're going to ask for commitments. We are uh, asking you to write down on the faith promise card that you see in your missions booklet what God is asking you to give to support these different ministry uh, organizations and opportunities. These, if you look in the booklet, you'll see the variety of different ministries and missionaries that we're supporting, but you'll see in the commons that we have other ones as well. Not all of the ones who are listed in the booklet have a table, but you'll see other ones at the tables, like the student mi- uh, ministries. You'll see other ones that are out there that aren't included in the faith promise, but they're instead uh, different ones that we partner with as well through our church. So take a look at your booklet, take a look at the commitment card, and fill it out. See what God is asking you to give. Um, We'll be collecting the cards at the end of the service. If you're viewing online, if you're doing our live stream, there will be a button for you to, to click to give as well at the end of the service. So keep an eye on that. Um, at the end of the service, we'll be collecting those cards. Yeah. One of the things that we're trying to emphasize in our mission's focus is how it is that God is at work cross-culturally. And cross-culturally, that, that happens internationally, of course, but that can also happen in our neck of the woods, too, and that which is happening locally. And so not only in your booklet are things represented that are specifically cross-cultural uh, and international, Uh, But there's also things that are very local and are specific to the community that uh, surrounds us. And one of the um, ministries and missionaries that we support that is a, I think, just beautifully epitomizes both of these things, a cross-cultural emphasis and a local emphasis, is From Scattered to Gathered. From Scattered to Gathered is probably a ministry that many of you have heard about, but if you haven't, it is headed by our very own Bruce and Julie Adamson, who have been a part of this church for a long time. We all, uh, we all many of us, I should say, know them, know them well. 
And um, for Bruce and Julie, uh, they've been at From Scattered to Gathered really only a, a handful of years. Prior to that, though, they were um, in a completely different part of the world. They were the Ivory Coast and then in Senegal doing tremendous work as God was leading them. And recently, over the last few years, just came back here to the States and began partnering with Converge. Converge is the denomination that we're a part of uh, here at North Haven Church. And they've basically sent Bruce and Julie out into our community, our backyard, to work with uh, the diaspora, that is uh, refugees that, have, that are now living in this uh, part of the world, in our backyard, in our communities, and uh, are really desperate to find discipleship and connection. Um, and that's what Bruce and Julie are committed to do. They're going to talk about that here uh, this morning. We're going to celebrate how God is using them. But before we hear from them, I want you to watch this video to find out a little bit more um, about From Scattered to Gathered. Straddling the Mississippi River, the Twin Cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul, Minnesota, are home to nearly 3.5 million people. Until recent decades, most local residents traced their heritage to ancestors from Scandinavia and other European countries. Today, however, a diverse mosaic of immigrants from around the world now call this place home. Nearly one out of three residents living in the Twin Cities are first or second generation immigrants from places like Somalia, Bosnia, Cambodia, Iran, India, Nepal, and Tibet. Many come for employment opportunities or to pursue higher education. Many come as refugees fleeing war, natural disaster, and persecution. Most come simply to build a better life for their families in peace and security. As these men, women, and children of different ethnicities come to Minnesota from many different places and for just as many different reasons, they bring with them many different religious identities. Mosques dot dozens of neighborhoods around Minneapolis and St. Paul, serving as places of worship for over 200,000 Muslim residents. Approximately 50,000 Hindus live, work, and play in the Twin Cities. Many worship at the largest Hindu temple in North America. And rising from the cornfields just south of the Twin Cities, the continent's largest Cambodian Buddhist temple is a pilgrimage site for worshipers near and far. Before coming to the Twin Cities seeking a better life, they had been scattered across the globe. Now they are gathered here with us. They are our neighbors, our friends, and our co-workers. What if they became our friends? What will it take for them to become our beloved brothers and sisters in Christ? We can show them what it truly means to have an abundant life that can only be experienced through a relationship with Jesus. God is calling us to respond. Converge International Ministries has created an initiative called From Scattered to Gathered, also known as FS2G, to do just that. We are asking God for a gospel movement among every least reached immigrant people group in the Twin Cities. We believe that from these people groups, God will gather disciples into reproducing kingdom communities and use them to create gospel impact here in their households, near throughout their extended relationship networks, and far back in their countries of origin. We start local to go global. As the gospel takes root locally, the good news travels globally. The FS2G initiative team partners with churches in the Twin Cities to help them discover God's heart for the foreigner, while also developing pathways for gaining access to and serving the nations next door. Ultimately, spirit-filled disciple makers are identified, trained, and released into local cross-cultural ministry. People from all over the world who previously had little access to the gospel are now within your arm's reach and Jesus' embrace. Will you join us? If you and your church are ready to love, serve, and disciple your least reached neighbors to make disciples of all nations and be used to make kingdom impact, contact the FS2G team today. All right, please welcome to the stage Bruce and Julie Adamson. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, church. It's good to be with you this morning. Um, thanks for the introduction, Adam. And uh, by the way, uh, as, as Adam mentioned, we are uh, seeking to gather together a consortium of churches that would support this initiative, FS2G. 
um, from Scattered to Gathered. And Adam is actually uh, a part of our leadership team. And North Haven is a, is a part of our, uh, one of the churches on the consortium. So Julie and I want to thank you so much for the many years, uh, 24 years. You partnered with us uh, while we served in West Africa. And um, as he mentioned, we've been back since the summer of 2018. Uh, we were invited back to help launch this new, this new initiative. The pilot program is right here in the Twin Cities, so they're hoping that what we're doing in, in helping local churches engage diaspora communities, in other words, uh, immigrants and refugees, that these might be multiplied in other um, gateway cities throughout the, the U.S. And those are cities where there are, are very large um, populations of end-of-the-earth sorts of people, folks that have come, have migrated to our cities from, um, from across the world. So I, I think most of us are well aware, just driving around even White Bear Lake and North St. Paul here, that our, that our neighborhoods are changing. Um, the, the demographics are changing. And for Julie and me, that's very exciting. We live up in the northern suburbs of St. Paul, of, uh, St. Paul and, and uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, we hardly ever saw someone dressed in a, in a hijab, but now we see it all the time. So, so um, our, our cities are changing, and, and uh, we're excited about the opportunity that we have to engage with local churches, help local churches think strategically about what it would mean to um, see the gospel um, uh, grasped by these communities and flowing through the communities, seeing disciples making disciples and churches planting churches within these communities. So. Um, we're very excited that North Haven is a part of that, that consortium. As Adam mentioned, we've just been at this for a few years. So um, it's, it, it's, it's actually, for both Julie and I, um, it, it's been sort of a, um, a mind shift for us in many ways. We were um, really unaware of the, the challenges and the opportunities that uh, this type of ministry involves. It's, it's very different from saltwater missions where, uh, where we were involved for 24 years, where we were traveling to a different location. We were in the minority as, as American missionaries in, living in, in two very large uh, West African cities, reaching out to uh, majority populations that were Muslim background. Now we're dealing with folks who are coming here who are in the minority. Um, and um, oftentimes they have sort of an insul insular um, mindset about what it means to live now in, in a setting where they are in the minor, minority, sort of circle the wagons and protect our community. So sometimes it's really hard for the, the church to discover ways to break into those communities in, in a good way uh, by loving and serving and blessing and with the end goal of actually discipling families into relationship with Jesus. I just wanted to share a little bit about... Um, where we get this name from Scattered to Gathered, um, and then we're going to end this, this morning with just a couple of diaspora stories of two, two individuals that Julie and I have had the pleasure of, of engaging with um, over the course of the last um, couple of years in particular. But Acts 17 is sort of the theme verse of our, of our initiative. Um, from one man, this is Paul preaching uh, to the Areopagus in Athens, uh, obviously, uh, some of you have, have traveled to Athens. It's a, um, a city full of idols, um, and that really struck the Apostle Paul as he was uh, communicating uh, there, uh, and his heart, of course, was burning um, for, for Jesus and the gospel, the proclamation of the gospel. Uh, and he says here, from one man he created all nations throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall, he determined the boundaries. He's, his purpose was for the nations to seek after God and to perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. So we've, that is a passage that sort of declares this idea that God is about um, moving peoples uh, into, uh, into a, a position where, where they can uh, not only hear the gospel, but they can respond to the, the truth of the gospel. They can discover Jesus. And um, it's sort of enlightened us as we've read the scriptures. We've discovered that God is a God of movement. God is a God of multiplication. God is a God of migration. He is, uh, reading the Old Testament, you, you read about the Exodus and deportations. And, and even to the very beginning, speaking of multiplication, God said to Adam, 
be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So we've, we've just been struck with this idea that God is, is passionate about multiplication, and, and in particular, in fulfillment of the, of the Great Commission. Um, go and make disciples of all nations. Well, um, we need to go. It's, it's not just a matter of crossing an ocean. So in the case of diaspora missions, we just need to cross the street and, and tell folks that have never heard about Jesus who he is. So um, it's, a, it's a challenge that, that faces the church, but it's, it's an amazing opportunity to, um, to press into uh, God's, what God's heart is. It's God's heart beats for the nations. Um, and, you, and you can, that's, that's uh, uh, really fulfilled in its ultimate sense in Revelation, uh, where we read in Revelation 5 about uh, these peoples from every nation, tribe, and tongue surrounding the great white throne. So that's the fulfillment. We have a long ways to go before that can be fulfilled in our, in our generation. So um, I'm just going to ask Julie, that, you know, uh, Adam mentioned the word diaspora. A lot of people don't really know what that word means. It's just, it's a term that comes from Greek, which means to sow or scatter. So God is about sowing the nations, and then the church needs to be about gathering them to, to Jesus. And then it's sort of it just reproduces itself. Then there needs to be more scattering because there are still so many more people who have never heard the name of Jesus. So that's where we get the name from, Scattered Together. Julie's going to share a story about um, a young woman that, that we met. Uh, by the, well, she, she's better with dates. But anyway, her name is uh, Marim. And before I tell you a little bit about Marim, there are a couple verses out of Second Corinthians that just really inform, as God's people... Um, a very special role that we have as his people. Uh, Second Corinthians from uh, the fifth chapter, God is reconciling the world to, Christ, him, in, to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he is committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God was making his appeal through us. Ambassadors go. They don't wait for people to come to them. They go and they take this very special, amazing message. They're not, we're not bringing a religion to people. We're not bringing a code of ethics or a new set of traditions. We're bringing them the news that they can have relationship with God. And, um, and we go with that. The other um, passage that I just love is also from 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Our lives are a Christ-like fragrance rising up to God, but this fragrance is perceived differently by those who are being saved and by those who are perishing. To those who are perishing, we are a dreadful smell of death and doom, but to those who are being saved, we are a life-giving perfume. We don't know who's who, and around us, but we need to position ourselves to go out where we can, um, where we can be sensed by people. And um, lest you think that it always needs a big program, um, I just want to tell you, as Bruce said, a story of something that happened that was just, it started with just a little going. And Bruce was picking up some groceries shortly before Christmas, <clears throat> And ahead of him were two women wearing hijabs. And they checked out, and then he checked out and went out to his car and realized that they were actually walking down the street with their um, bags of groceries. And it was cold, and it was actually snowy. And so he, he just decided to drive the car up alongside them and offer them a ride. And the younger girl kind of was very hesitant. But the older... It's kind of a creepy thing to do, but I did it anyway. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure that we always recommend it, but um, the younger woman, she, as I said, was hesitant, but the older woman, she just opened the car door and climbed in. And um, they drove just about three and a half blocks, maybe, from that store to a very small apartment building, and they got out, and the older woman had actually tears in her eyes. And she just said, shukran, shukran, thank you, thank you. And um, Bruce just you know, said, I'm so glad to have been able to do that for you, and, and God bless you today. That's all the going was. But we did go again, because we now knew where they lived. 
So armed with some Chris Christmas cookies. That was creepy. <laughs> we uh, went back to the apartment building a few days later, and I noticed that one of the apartments on the second floor had very heavy drapery in the windows, and we thought, I bet that's where they live. So we were able to get in and knocked on the door, <clears throat> and a young man answered the door. His name was Abdi, and he spoke perfect English. And he just, ex um, we kind of explained why we were there, <clears throat> and he just he really thought that was nice and strange that we would come back with cookies. But he told us they were from Iraq. They had been living there about six months, having come from Louisville to Minnesota. And we just had a really interesting chat with him. He was a senior at Centennial High School. And um, <clears throat> after we visited, we just said, well, we'll come again, because we'd like to meet your mom and your sister. So um, it was a few weeks later. We went back. This time I had brownies. And uh, they welcomed us in. They were very hospitable. We sat down and had something to drink and some sweets and just began talking, mostly through Abdi, because the mother didn't speak any English. Marim spoke a little bit, but Abdi kind of led us through the conversation. We learned about their family, uh, that they had been a very influential family in Iraq, that um, they had owned a big home there, and because their apartment was very modest here, uh, hardly any furniture, and I think that was a, a bit embarrassing to them. But they wanted us to know all these good things about their family, and, and then Marim, the daughter, began to talk very quietly and kind of excitedly, but in broken English to me, and she told me, as they were continuing their conversation, that she was a secret believer, that she, Jesus had appeared to her, a number of years passed, and ever since then, she had placed her faith in him. She was learning about him online. Um, it was just an amazing story that was beginning. She was wanting to tell me, and she gave me her WhatsApp number because she wanted to keep in touch. Well, the mother obviously was getting wind of what was happening here, and Marim had told me the family did not like that at all. And so the mother went over to the window to a, bit, a little table and took out a a box that had something wrapped in cloth in it, and it was a Quran. And she kissed the Quran and came back and sat with us and opened it and just began reading in Arabic, louder and louder and on and on. And um, we knew that she was not comfortable with us being there anymore. And so we just thanked them for the visit, and I said that, you know, we would come back again sometime. Well, Marim and I communicated over WhatsApp for a couple months, and her story would take me an hour to tell you, but she is a hero of the faith, living in a really hard place, even in our own country, in our own backyard. But we did go back. I, this time I went with Ellie, our daughter. She had just returned from Jordan and had learned a lot of Arabic. And so she and I went and visited with Nadi, the mother, and Marim. And Nadi was very friendly because she could talk now. And she told Ellie all about, they talked about Lebanon because they had both lived there before and, and were comparing notes. And then the conversation kind of abruptly came to, well, God is one. You believe that Jesus is God. And she just began kind of throwing at us some of the typical um, objections they have to people who follow Jesus. And, and Marim, um, she was uncomfortable. But the mother went over one more time and got the Quran out, kissed it, and began reading. And Marim told us that she was reading passages about infidels and that she didn't want us to be there anymore. So um, it just, to me, was the, it was just like that verse in 2 Corinthians about the fragrance of Christ. To one, I stunk. I was not wanted there. I was a threat. But to the other, it was life-giving. And we don't know who's going to respond to our fragrance, but we need to go and position ourselves. And the Lord, the Lord does the life-changing work. But um, all of us have these kinds of opportunities, even if it's just a few steps that we go initially. So pray for Marim. I told her I was going to be sharing a little of her story today, and what would she like you to know? And she just said, pray for me. It's so hard. So think of Marim. She's 34 years old and pretty much imprisoned in her, her home. So. Thanks, honey. 
Yeah, um, I think we'll just stay with that with that uh, story this morning. But um, so we're just recognizing that um, this this mission that that God has for not just Julie and myself, but for the church in general is um, it's a it's a mission of as Julie talked about it from Second Corinthians of being an ambassador of the gospel and. Um, the kingdom of God is not sedentary. Um, the church is not sedentary. The gospel is not sedentary. Um, the, 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 the kingdom of God is meant to expand and grow um, as the gospel is, is, is preached to all nations. So we just leave you with that message. We're super excited that um, Pastor Adam is a part of our team. Um, we've had some great conversations with, with him and some others from, from uh, North Haven about um, some things that we might be pursuing here, even in East St. Paul. So, um, but uh, we just want to get Jesus out of the pews and into the world. So, thanks. Bruce and Julie are giants. I, uh, I absolutely love them. I am so thankful that they're a part of our church and thankful for what they're doing uh, for the Lord. Uh, this is Pastor Don. I'm going to invite him up to the stage. And um, so uh, we are going to now have an opportunity to respond, as we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks. Our faith promise is, is critical. Um, we uh, believe in these missionaries, like Bruce and Julie, and ministries from Scattered Together, and so many others that are in your booklet, those that are out in the commons. We want to see them succeed because we believe they're doing a tremendous work for the kingdom. And uh, they need financial stability in order to be able to do the work that God has called them to. And uh, so we've been asking you to prayerfully consider uh, giving towards this year's Faith Promise, 2022's Faith Promise. Um, and uh, hopefully you've been taking seriously, praying about that. And we want to respond now. You have those Faith Promise commitment cards. And in just a moment, we're going to invite you forward to uh, drop those off in a basket. Um, and for those of you that are online, you can see this button here. It's uh, popping up here on your screen. And you click on that button, and you can indicate your 2022 Faith Promise commitment that way. Uh, but Don, you want to give us a brief history of our Faith Promise? Well, for over 25 years, our congregation has participated in Faith Promise. Prior to that, the elders would take 10% of our uh, budget, the year of the, year of the budget, and uh, earmark it for missions, uh, international and local. Uh, but the church started thinking about how do we want to respond? And as Aaron had said earlier, we began to pray, God, how do you want me to be involved in missions. How can I participate? So it was not the idea of giving our money to God, but it was how do, God, how do I use the money you're providing me so I can be involved in missions? So Faith Promise began about 25 years ago, a little over 25 years ago. And from that point on, we've had much more exponential amount of money more available to missions than we had before because the generosity, not only of our people, but the generosity of God was able to uh, be, be uh, tapped into, and we've been helping missionaries and individuals and organizations across the world. So we're going to um, now take a, a few moments and invite you forward. Pastor Don's going to be out at the front there. And if, as you feel led, we ask that you bring those faith promise commitment cards and drop them off in the basket. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Speak what is true. Here's my heart, Lord. my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Speak what is true. Cause I am found. 
I am yours, I am love, I'm made pure, I have life, I can breathe, I am healed, I am free. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for today. We ask, Lord, that as you use these resources, Father, not just these financial resources, Lord, but how you've gifted us, how you've equipped us for the work that you've called us to, we pray, Father, that we would live our lives as ones that hold loosely the things that we maybe wrongly assume are ours, and instead, Father, would allow that to be given to you and to others. And I pray, Father, that we would give in, live lives of surrender, fully and completely to the cause of Christ and the cross. We thank you, Lord. Be with us as we leave this place here today. In your name we pray, and all of God's people said, amen. Thank you for being here. Go to the missions fair. Hope your day is blessed. Bye now. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart.